Good morning and welcome to It's Showtime, Diversity in the Arts Takes Center Stage. I'm Lori Magid, Law School Class of 1985. As a member of the board of the Columbia Alumni Association, the CAA, which has planned this weekend of alumni leadership events, and as a member of CAA's Arts Access Committee, and as a member of the alumni working group responsible for the She Opened the Door events, I have the great privilege of welcoming members of all three of my wonderful Columbia communities, arts leaders, alumni leaders and alumni to this program today. The arts serve to nourish and inspire all of us in good times and in bad. And Columbia alums have helped take the lead in the goal of making sure that every aspect of the arts are more diverse and inclusive. This morning, you will hear from two of those remarkable Columbia alums, Marcia Sells and Alicia Graf Mack, in conversation with my law school classmate, Gregory Peterson. Gregory attended the law school after having attended the college and having a career in the arts. So he did go on to become a corporate lawyer, but Gregory has remained fully engaged in the arts community. Still as a performer, albeit now an amateur, mostly in light opera and choral singing, but also as an arts collector and donor. He serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations supporting the arts, including the Professional Organization of Women Artists, where he also serves as general counsel. He's also an author, most recently of New York Stilled, an account of New York during the lockdown coming out this winter. And perhaps most important, Gregory is a very active and much appreciated member of the CAA's Arts Access Committee. So with that, I will turn the program over to Gregory, but I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us this morning as we consider these important and interesting issues regarding diversity in the arts. Gregory? It's all yours. Thank you, Lori, and thanks to Columbia for providing this opportunity to discuss such a timely and important subject. Now, let me introduce our panelists, if we can have our side. She's the first ever chief diversity officer at the Metropolitan Opera. A graduate of Barnett and Columbia Law, this door opener is also a former dancer with the Dance Theater of Harlem. She has several extraordinary careers in the arts, academia, business, law, public service, and community affairs. She is the former Dean of Students at Harvard Law School and has held positions as Associate Vice President at Columbia, Educational Consultant for Dance Theater of Harlem, Vice President of the National Basketball Association, and Assistant District Attorney for Kings County. We're pleased to welcome our panelist, Marcia Sells, and she will be with us live in just a moment, but let me show you her dancing credits here. Now, she is the first ever person of color to serve as director of dance at the Juilliard School. A magna cum laude graduate of general studies, our panelist has been a dancer with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and has also been a leading dancer with Dance Theater of Harlem and Complexion's Contemporary Ballet. She stands as a guest performer with Alonzo King's Lines Ballet, Beyonce, John Legend, Andre 3000, and Alicia Keys. Our panelist also holds an MA in nonprofit management from Washington University in St. Louis. We welcome our panelists, Arisha, Alicia Graf Mack and Marcia Sells.
Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So our topic for discussion is systemic racism in the performing arts and what can be done to erase it. But before we jump to solutions, we need to understand what it is, how it affects performers, behind the scene workers and audiences. I'd like to start by hearing from you what your careers in the arts have, been meant, have meant for you and how you believe they might have been affected by, or uh, to put it nicely, lack of diversity. Marcia, do you have any observations on that subject? Um, yes, and um, as someone who um, preceded um, Alicia in terms of Dance Theater of Harlem, we have that and a m number of things now in common since we're both on the Lincoln Center campus. Um, when I started in dance, in ballet uh, in 1964, when my mother put me in a ballet program at the, what was then called the Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati, and then it became part of the university um, and now is the sort of fabled um, College Conservatory of Music, um, which has both dance and opera and music training. Mm -hmm. um, I was the only black child in the ballet program and I stayed for many years as the only black um, person in the Cincinnati, both in the training program and then for a short time, even in the ballet company. Um, and so I wasn't always, I, I didn't see people who looked like me when I first started, but I, I'm grateful that I also had parents who were engaged in the arts and interested in the arts and, and didn't focus on who wasn't present, but taking me there. But then I had the, the wonderful and blessed opportunity in 1969 to see Dance Theater of Harlem. They came to Cincinnati as part of what was a kind of pre-tour before the company was really um, going out full, full tilt. And that was because of, um, I should say, another Ailey connection, a man by the name of Jimmy Truitt, who is one of the founding members of Alvin Ailey, but was teaching modern dance, which was at the time he and Thelma Hill started teaching there. It was the first time modern dance had been taught at that program. And he let uh, then David McLean, who was running the school and also artistic director of the ballet company, know that they should invite since, you know, the Dance Suite of Harlem to come and see. And there I saw a full company of black and brown ballerinas and male dancers doing ballet and doing it with a flair and a style. And I knew that it was possible um, because prior to that moment, Arthur Mitchell, honestly, was the only person I had known, but I had not seen him dance, who had been a Black person in ballet, because he was the first um, African-American principal of New York City Ballet. Um, so I didn't know if it was going to be possible. So those are the things I would say from my generation that were the challenges. And then, thankfully, there's a dance theater of Harlem that Alicia can see when she's growing up. Um, and at that point, the company was really in its full stride. So I will pass it off to, to Alicia at that at this point. Thank you, Marcia. That's exactly right. You know, I, I grew up very aware that I was uh, standing in the, the legacy of people who came before me. Um, I am a biracial child, um, child, <laughs> I guess a grown up now. But um, as, I, as I grew up, um, my parents really exposed me to all the possibilities of dance. They, were, they weren't dancers, but um, I have a, a great aunt who became a dance critic very late in her life. And she would send me all of the press material uh, from all the performances that she would see in New York. So growing up as a young person, I had posters of Virginia Johnson on my wall, of Alvin Ailey, of Judith Jameson. So I grew up with these images um, and they really fueled me. I didn't realize though that the first time that I actually saw a real live brown ballerina um, was when I was about 12 years old. I had been training since I was two. Uh, Christina Johnson from Dance Theater of Harlem and Donald Williams came to my town to perform in a festival, a summer festival. And I remember sitting there, I had seen many performances growing up in um, Columbia, Maryland is right between Baltimore and Washington. So I saw a lot of performances at the Kennedy Center, um, 
many different ballet companies and um, you know different types of uh, other sorts of companies. But the first time I saw a brown ballerina, I, it hit me. I saw uh, the curtain went up and this beautiful brown ballerina in a yellow tutu with brown point shoes and brown tights, something that I had never really seen live and I had never worn before, came boring across the floor to Donald Williams and I just cried, I weeped because it was the first time that I saw me live in person, the possibility of what that could be. Um, and I remember Donald Williams taught a class that same day and signed a pair of my pink point shoes saying, maybe one day I'll see you at Dance Theater of Harlem. So uh, I, I you know, continued my training. And when I was in my senior year of high school, um, I was starting to consider whether I go to college or whether I pursue a, a career in ballet. And at that time, I didn't think that color was a barrier. I don't know, maybe it was just like total, you know, just me being naive or, I, I don't know what it was. I thought my height would be my biggest barrier because on point I stand six foot two. Uh, and many of the programs that I trained at at School of American Ballet and American Ballet Theater and I trained at the Kirov School over summer um, just said, you know, you're too tall. So that was the thing. You can't escape your color. You certainly can't escape your height either. So th that was what I thought I was up against. When I met, when I met Arthur Mitchell, when I was 17 years old, he said, why are, you, why are you shrinking? Why are you dancing so small? Bigger, larger. And he, he loved me for all of me. And I could see looking around the room that that was the case. So that was the pride in which I stepped into my career and that I've, I've really held ever since. That's, so can, that's my beginning. <laughs> can I ask, what do you perceive your, you know, the, um, the fact that uh, ballets tend to be exclusively white has on audiences who go to the theater. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> I think that, I mean, so an example. So when I was in Cincinnati Ballet, um, even after, you know, when I wound up in the company as an apprentice in Cincinnati, this is 1973, um, 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 Cincinnati Ballet does, gets a nutcracker and decides it's going to do that. Um, at this point, I've done lots of performances, a number of you know other uh, ballets, and I am both going to be one of the toys. I'm going to play a poodle, and I'm also going to be a snowflake and a flower. <clears throat> um, I tell this story because I always remember it. My mother remembers because she told me sitting in the audience, and a child, a white child, sitting in the audience goes you know, after the seeing the, cause it's the intermission after the snow section and they're heading to the, the land of the sweets. The child turns to his mother goes, I've never seen a black snowflake. And so my mother goes, you've never seen candy dance. <laughs> what my mother was relaying. And I always thought, was she too hard on that child? But what she was relaying is, and, and trying to have this child understand one, it's also a, a fantasy and a fairy tale, but also don't let yourself be limited. And I do think that that has been the challenge. I know in the early days of Dance Theater of Harlem when I was performing and we would go to, to around the country, around the world, some people were shock and awe. Some, you know, that, oh, we're dancing on, you're dancing on point. Or sometimes there was also the confusion of like, oh, you're not Alvin Ailey, you're not, <laughs> um, not that there's anything, Alvin Ailey is an amazing, fabulous, wonderful company, but Dance Theater of Harlem and Alvin Ailey are two different companies. Um, so the challenge is, I think, in people not seeing um, non-Europeans, or I just say non-whites non on the stage, challenge their perceptions of what the art form could be, and whether or not you could have, you know, a black, a black snowflake, or you could have a black you know, swan or, you know, or have even in the, you know, all the variations of, of ballets, could Black people be in the Balanchine ballets, even though there's no story <laughs> to any of them. It's, and it's all, you know, leotards and tights for most of their, their, their ballets. It, it shouldn't, it should just be about the art form and about the art. But I do think 
from those early days, not seeing black people or not perceiving them as being able to do it. And then we also lived with a lot of the characteristics of, I was a student at School of American Ballet. I got the Ford Foundation scholarship for, for a summer there. And I remember uh, then the head of the school saying, well, I don't know, your, your rear, rear end is a, maybe a little too big and you might have to change your nose. And I'm also a generation when, you know, quote, corrective surgery was not just something suggested to black people, but to white um, dancers too. But I remember telling my mother, oh, she says that my nose is maybe too big or that my rear end and my mom's like, you're not having any <laughs> surgery. <laughs> Nothing like that is happening. But those are the kinds of challenges that I know that many black dancers faced. And those like Arthur Mitchell or um, Walter Raines or, or Sebastian, um, oh, I'm gonna blank on Sebastian's last name, who was one of the early black with the um, Canadian National Ballet. They had to go to Europe first to get their start in the, in the 1950s and 60s to have that kind of opportunity. Um, to dance because at least they seem to have been a little bit more open in, in, in European um, houses of, of theater. So I that's, think that those were some of the challenges. That's similar to Josephine Baker having gone to Paris just to be a perform, jazz performer. Right, Lisa, right. Do you have any issues like that, a perception um, of, you know, that weren't expect, exactly wanted? I have to say that um, because I spent the majority of my career in Black spaces, I don't feel that I've personally had some of those experiences where I've been told that I need to uh, change my body or make up my skin or, uh, and I, you know, I have to say again, I, I, I stand in a legacy of people who went through a lot before me so that I could stand firmly in my brown shoes and feel like, wow, okay, now it's my turn to make inroads for, for young people. Um, We're talking about um, role models and um, um, door openers um, in, in a moment, we'll have a, a whole sec, sec segment uh, devoted to that. But if you don't mind, I'd like to add my own experience as an audience member. <clears throat> I was going to the opera a lot when I was a kid and this would have been in like the 60s and 70s. And at that time, there were very, very big non-white stars at the Metropolitan, for example, there was Leontine Price, uh, Martina Royal, all the, Grace Bunbury, all these people. And uh, so I could see, you know, myself more or less reflected on the stage. And one day I decided to go to see the New York City Ballet and they were doing rubies. So, um, sorry, they were doing jewels. So it starts with emeralds and looking at emeralds and you know, there's like 30 dancers and I'm thinking, do you think there's a black person in there? No, well, no. okay. And then they do rubies and I'm looking, looking, looking and it's a beautiful ballet, but you know, it's like, uh, there's, gee, don't they have even like a, 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 a back singer? <laughs> I mean, a, 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 a core member or just one? No, okay. And then came diamonds. So in rubies, they're green and I'm sorry, in emeralds, they're green and rubies, they're red. By the time it's diamonds, like even the costumes are all white. And it's Peter Martins with his blonde hair. And I said, you know what? I don't really don't know about this. <laughs> and it took, it took a couple of years, several years before I started going back. And um, I just decided that balancing was too much of a genius to miss it. And then I did see a couple of, you know, black dancers here and there. Um, but just for, you know, this is just a, a non-professional and audience member's perspective on that subject. Um, yeah, I think I think that reminds me of um, you know that there's still so much work to be done with the idea that we can be integrated and that there doesn't only have to be only one. Which I think dancers who are making inroads, dancers of color who are making inroads in companies like New York City Ballet and American Ballet <clears> Theater. <throat> Um, are still considered other in so many ways. And, you know, throughout my career, it's been interesting because I've been compared to other white dancers, like I'm the black version of Sylvie Guillem or 
you know, there can't be a Misty Copeland and an Alicia Graff at the same time. There has to be one or the other. Um, and I think from, you know, various reviews that I've read uh, and from critics, uh, that also, that perception, it has to change. When we so go to the theater when, and not notice, that's when I think we'll, we'll, we will have been successful. Absolutely. absolutely. Have you had the experience of like going to auditions thinking, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm a dancer, I'm pretty good. And, and then they're turned down, although, you know, there's no reason given and you, you have an idea what that reason might be. Yeah, certainly. Um, and that, that happens, you know, rejection is definitely a, a part of being a dancer and an artist where you have to audition and you're cast in roles. I, I think I've chosen, I know, I've, I've actively chosen not to color my world with what I know is systemic racism and say, if that opportunity wasn't meant for me, it wasn't meant for me. And there's so many opportunities out there that were meant for me, where I was um, embraced in spaces where I didn't have to question my color or my background or my height. You know, working at Dance State of Harlem was like stepping into Wakanda. <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> I, you walk in the room and you see every single shade of brown you could ever imagine with people from all over the world, not just African-American dancers, but dancers from Japan and Haiti and you know, South, South Africa and South America, all over, all over the world to know that this is possible. And I think that, um, and I'm sure Marsha will agree that working in spaces like that, knowing this is possible has helped to fuel uh, my vision as a as a arts administrator, as a leader, as um, someone who, you know, works with young people, because there was no question. Of course, right. they're amazing. Right. Come right. on. Right. You know, the idea I think of quote black excellence wasn't a question, and and because it was answered the moment yeah. you walked into that that studio and that space. But I, I mean. But I mean, I started my quote professional career in a in an all white ballet company, which honestly, I mean, David McLean made changes. But I also say, you know, since I was young in that space, my mother stood in. I mean, one of the things she said to him, I remember when they were, you know, the sort of moment when you're going to move from quote simply being a student in a school, and now the school's going to put you on a scholarship and get your point shoes, all these things, which are quite honestly. It, they're expensive, even though I was blessed to have family who could afford that, it still gets costly. But she said to Mr. McLean then, she goes, don't, I wasn't in the room, but my mother says, she, it was clear, don't um, mess with her. Don't let this be where you um, encourage her talent, but then you're not going to move her into opportunities. She's really talented then I hope you'll actually use her, which I think the person that David McLean was, um, it, he was going to do that, but to have someone like a, who is a champion for her child, like my mother, yeah. who also knew the orcs and, and clearly also a, a child having, my mother having been born in the thirties and, you know, born in the South and segregation, she understood, right. you know, the impacts of race. So she made sure you know, paving the way for her child. And then Cincinnati Ballet also started adding more mm -hmm. dancers of color um, while I were there, because I can, you know, think of some people like Kevin Ward, who wound up also being in Dance Theater of Harlem later years, but also became the, the director for um, Dayton Contemporary Dance Company. Mm -hmm. um, so there were others who started coming into that company, but it was different when I walked into Dance Theater of Harlem. Yes. I think we can all agree that yeah. there's been a lot of change. And actually, I'd like to talk to a personal story I have on this subject having to do with change. If, if Doreen, I can have the next slide. Um, I, I um, grew up with Gilbert and Sullivan uh, from the fourth grade on. I was uh, very familiar with it and really loved it. And there was a really terrific amateur group 
that I knew of in New York. And just to give you an example of how spectacular this group has been, if I can get to the next slide. Yes, this is the sort of the level of production that they do. It's, it's as good as City Opera or even sometimes you think better, you know, as, as on a very, very high level. And I really wanted to be in that group. Well, I got invited to join and for years, I was going up and auditioning for parts and being turned down. And to audition for a part, you've got to memorize the lines, you've got to sing the songs, you've got to stand in front of an audience and do a whole bit. And then of course you get rejected if you don't get a part. Well, year after year I was being rejected. And then at one point, um, I was the only person auditioning for a particular role. So I thought, well, I got to get it this time. And I was turned down. And then I was told by one of the casting um, um, committee members that they wanted to have traditional casting. So I had been auditioning for like seven years for roles that they never knew they were never going to give me anyway. Um, well, years went by and there was a lot of change uh, in our society and in this group uh, altogether. And so I dropped out for a while, but then I came back and about 20 years ago, I decided to audition whatever the hell and I was actually cast as the Mikado in um, a fabulous production they did of that operetta, which was a huge deal, um, being the first person of color ever to have a role in um, this company. And since then, many people have joined of color and had there been many people with very beautiful voices on big roles, even a black person playing a Swedish count, it's um, been a big change. And to give credit to this company, they last year created a diversity committee and asked me to be the co-chair. So that is an inspiring story that I thought I would share. Um, if we can go back now to, um, um, Marsha, do you have anything like that? Oh, I think, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, as I pointed out, even in terms of the changes in doing the Nutcracker, I mean, there was a time when if you were a black <clears throat> dancer, you were gonna only be cast in quote, what they called Arabian um, in those days. And, and uh, even in those days too, if there was a white dancer doing it, they might be quote in brown face and, and things like that aren't done anymore. And, and there's also changes too, even in terms of what was called the quote Chinese dance. Now that's, change in terms of tea dance. I think that, and, and you know, and then you look at something like Hamilton, that's, you know, it's not just about non-traditional casting, it's about a quote recasting and thinking about the new lens by looking at the history through people of color um, as the characters <laughs> that we know, you know, were, were, you know, all white men and white women. I, I think that that's also reshaped it um, as, as well as, you know, a younger generation, if we're, for those of us in art forms that are quote considered, um, quote, uh, specifically European, meaning opera, classical music, ballet, for us to attract new audiences, we also have to show that we are relevant. And, mm -hmm. and I think creating those spaces for casting and for even new stories, it's not just even the casting in, in the old stories, it's the creation of new stories too that are gonna bring in the next generation of audiences. But audiences now are saying, I want to see myself up there. I want to be able to recognize um, um, a story, a person that represents me. So every single organization, not just that they're adding diversity and inclusion directors um, or chief officers, are looking at the full panoply of what they present and put on, on the stage. And I think that that's absolutely critical. That's right, Marcia. Uh, from, uh, I'm, I may be going off script a little bit, but just riffing off of what you've just said, the idea that um, to have black people playing the roles, it's not enough now. You have to think about how you're integrating uh, cultures, voices throughout the entire organization from who's telling the story to who's playing the roles, to who's coaching and mentoring, to who is on the board, to who is 
whose stories get to be told. And, you know, I think about, I have to, because you're sitting here, fire shot up in my bones, um, the opera that's playing right now at the Met. Uh, for me to go see it, it was one of those moments. Like I got to, I got to experience what I think sometimes when people go to see Ailey or see Dan Cedar Parlum experience, where they see this authentic story um, told in a way that is true to our voice. Yeah. And, you know, talking about diversity, to walk into the theater and look around and see so many people of diverse backgrounds coming into the theater and experiencing this story was unbelievable. And the dance stole the show. So I was very <laughs> proud really of did, they did. They the house down. Uh -huh. so that was the most the exciting down. dance I have ever seen on an opera stage. And what was more, why there was so True. much applause, why there was so much applause um, for those who may be listening and uh, haven't seen the show, uh, there's a step scene where the main character is now going to a historically black college and um, is crossing for a fraternity. And you see uh, the, the traditional step dance, which is social, social dance that has been passed down for generations from slave times, the, the rhythms and steps. Um, to stand there and know like, wow, this is us, this is like truly us. It's not a caricature of, it's not like um, appropriated in any no. way. The choreographer is someone who is a dear friend of mine who also is very aware that she stands on the shoulders of an Alvin Ailey, uh, Catherine Dunham, who was a, you know, an anthropologist of traditional dance and how she brought that dance onto the concert dance stage. We're all very aware and, yeah. You know, I'm just, it is a, a beautiful sign of how the pioneers, people who have struggled to make a way, how now we're in leadership roles. Exactly. That's, that's it, just so amazing about that. It really is. And, and, and with the fire. The fight is different. The fight is yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. Let, us, let us talk about this fight and how it has progressed. I would like to show some of the real pioneers and brown groundbreakers in the performing arts in America. If we can go to my next slide. And let's bring the slide up. Okay. Cicerietta Jones, the color tour of soprano, born in 1868. She became the biggest um, African-American performer of her day. She was paid more than any other black performer. She was the very first person of color to perform at Carnegie Hall. But not only that, she performed around the world on five continents, including before the royal heads of Europe, and including the British um, royal family. Um, and um, she was the absolute first classical singer um, and, and the biggest star of her day. Uh, she's not well known now. Her, apparently, um, she, there are no recordings of her voice because she was so early in, 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 in time, but um, she was followed then by the next um, big singer who became a great civil rights figure, Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson was invited to sing at the White House by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1935. But when she had contracted to sing uh, at Constitution Hall in DC, the Daughters of the American Republic would not allow her on the stage. And this created a huge brouhaha. And ultimately it was arranged for her to sing instead at the Lincoln Memorial. Nation's most impressive Easter demonstration. 75,000 mass before Lincoln Memorial to hear Marian Anderson, colored contralto, make her capital debut at the Great Emancipator Shrine. Refusal of the DAR to let her use their hall and a countrywide controversy with this great gathering as the climax. 
the singer was invited by Secretary of the Interior, Ickes, who attends with Secretary of the Treasury, Morgenthau. Spectators include Supreme Court Justice Black, New York Senator Robert Wagner, and a host of notables. Here to listen to the voice acclaimed by many as the finest in a century. So later in her life, she became the first person of color to have a principal role at the Metropolitan Opera in 1955 to play the role of Ulrika in Umbalo in Mascara. This is a very famous photograph of her um, by Richard Avdon in that role. She was followed by Leontine Price, who became the first prima donna assoluta at the Met and who very famously played Cleopatra in the first performance in the New Met. She opened the New Met in 1966 in the role of Cleopatra in Antony and Cleopatra. Um, she paved the way for Kathleen Battle, for Jesse Norman, uh, and bring it up to date, we have Angel Blue now, who is um, standing on the shoulders of Cicerieta and Marian Anderson. <clears throat> and all who came before. We mentioned Catherine Dunham, who was a dancer, a choreographer, creator of the Dunham Dance Technique. She was an author and an educator, a social activist, and the first person of color ever to choreograph at the Met Opera. Alvin, uh, Arthur Mitchell, um, first black ballet dancer in the New York City Ballet, went on to found the Dance Theater of Harlem in 1969 as a response to the um, assassination of Martin Luther King. Here he is in a balancing ballet with Allegro Kent. And um, there he is uh, in, uh, as the um, choreographer he, he became. Misty Copeland now is, I would say, probably standing on his shoulders. Uh, in terms of um, uh, women groundbreakers, Sarah Caldwell was the first person ever to conduct the Met Opera Orchestra. And standing on her shoulders now is Natalie Stutzman, who has just been named to be the next music director of the Atlantic Symphony Orchestra. And of course, we all now can recognize this grand groundbreaker, Terence Blanchard, the composer of um, Fire Shut Up in My Bones at the Metropolitan. Okay. But you know, Terence will also tell that story too, and he does in the article of which that picture you showed, you know, talking about William Grant still trying three times presenting, you know, an opera, you know, that putting different operas that could have been on the Met before, you know, this moment. Um, and I think what Charles is also saying, you know, what Terrence is also saying is that the idea is that there are so many people who came before us, as Alicia and I were talking, who we stand on the shoulders of who've had these kinds of opportunities. I mean, even at City Ballet, there's Debbie Austin, who's the, is the first woman of color to be in the company and actually gets promoted to soloist. She goes on to be a principal in, in Pennsylvania Ballet. But, you know, it, but it, when Alicia was saying, you know, at one point, at least in City Ballet and even for a while too at ABT, it was like one at a time. Like one person could be there, but the other person then had to leave before the next person. and. You know, Albert Evans still is the only, you know, African American who's been a, he's the last African American to be a principal in New York City Ballet. And God rest his soul, he now passed away now almost six, seven years ago. But, you know, that, that was 25 years after Arthur Mitchell had left when he becomes a principal. So there is progress that's happening. So it's, it's happening in some ways, I think a little too slowly, but the, the fact that um, it's happening, but the, but I think programs like this and others that acknowledge here have been the challenges and here are the next steps and also the roles that Alicia and I have are I think examples of how we can also keep pushing um, the ball up the hill or the stone up the hill um, yeah. and, and, and see change. Alicia, 
Um, you're at Juilliard as head of dance, which is just an extraordinary accomplishment. Congratulations. I'd like to ask you and Marsha about the beside, behind the scenes roles, whether it's in arts administration or it's the crew, you know, what are the obstacles that a person of color um, or a woman um, who wants to be um, a lighting designer or an administrator in um, an arts institution, what are the obstacles, obstacles that they challenge and what's being done to address that? Hmm. Yes, I think um, just there, there are so few opportunities uh, that I think now it does take a visionary leader uh, <clears throat> like Marsha, I, I hope like myself, to identify um, talent and to mentor that talent and to support that talent in a way that can help them to thrive. Um, you know, I, I, I know that there have been many very successful students of color who've come through Juilliard, but even talking to alum, you know, hearing their stories, they're very proud of the education that they've received, they received and they're very proud of the careers that they had but oftentimes they talk about how hard it was to be, uh, you know, to always have to um, practice techniques that are not part of their own uh, upbringing or culture, uh, to have to perform ballets that don't necessarily connect with who they are, um, to study dance history that doesn't cover their history uh, to learn a classical canon of <clears throat> music, let's say they're a music student um, that doesn't honor all composers and that history. So it's really about taking a 360 look and really peeling away layers of how things have traditionally been taught so that we can support uh, incredible talent and see them into the future and into their careers. But Marsha, as diversity officer, what are you looking at more than just the performers? Because we discussed that a lot and we'll do it a little bit more. But what about, you know, the stage managers and the ticket sellers and all of all the people? What is it that you're looking to do to improve things at the Metropolitan Opera that could be reflected in other arts organizations around the country? Well, I, I also want to add, I mean, there are arts organizations around the country that a little bit of head of, of, of the Met even in terms of, you know, hiring around a chief diversity officer or looking at these issues around diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, and who started doing, it, so a lot of it is beginning the outreach, beginning the outreach for the, the range of jobs, so stage manager. So it starts with the types of internship programs that internship programs need to be paid because not everyone can you if, of the old days of the arts people would get a job and get an opportunity because you had an unpaid internship many it left out a lot of people many many people of color it also left out a lot of people in terms of socioeconomic um, backgrounds who could not indeed afford to have a quote free um you know to work for free um, and be supported by other family members. So, you know, we have a paid internship program that the Met is going is launching um, November 1st. Um, and we've gotten funding uh, from both um, a, a number of our funders. I can't announce them all because we're going to do those announcements, but from a number of board members and from um, another foundation. So it's been wonderful to see that. We also have a fellowship program for stage managers and stage directors. We have our first two who actually got to work on Fire Shut Up In My Bones um, as their very first opera. I mean, the fact that the very first opera that opened the season when we come back from a pandemic is an opera uh, <clears throat> by a black composer, you know, um, that is uh, directed by, uh, co-directed by a black person and uh, telling the story and the life of a black person as well as the, the librettist. Our two um, fellowship members, um, Camille and uh, Alitha, and Camille is actually also a Columbia graduate from the School of the Arts. Um, one of, is of our first fellowship stage director, um, both women of color, having more programs like that and, and partnerships, partnerships with institutions that have indeed been producing people who've gone into the theater, but haven't always had access to opportunities to institutions like the Met or San Francisco Opera or 
La Scala, and I mean historically black colleges and universities um, that have had these programs, we're doing those kinds of partnerships. Um, someone asked in the, in the chat the questions of how Columbia University and Barnard impacted um, and have had an impact. The fact that I went to an institution, particularly at Barnard, that is a women's college that looks at the issues of how women have been challenged, but also how women of color have been challenged in the world. Those are the kinds of things, along with my own lived experience, that have opened up um, this knowledge and figuring out how do you do that outreach? How do you begin to look and explore um, people who have not been part of your institutions before? These are the kinds of things that I have to say, honestly, both from my lived experience as a student, but also my experience working at, at Columbia, both in government and community affairs, but also the time as Dean of Students. It was always about how do you keep expanding opportunities for people who have not always been able to think about or see themselves at these institutions. Alicia, as a Columbia grad, is there any specific um, um, opportunity that you were able to bring to other people by virtue of being a Columbia person or that Columbia has provided to you specifically? Yeah, there's, there's too much to speak about in this one chat, but um, you know, when I, when I became a dancer, a professional dancer at 17, I thought that that's it. I never considered really going to college. It wasn't part of my career trajectory. I'd never thought of myself as anything but a dancer. If anybody asked me, what do you want to do when you get older? Yeah, I'm going to dance. I just thought it would be forever, you know. Uh, unfortunately, I had um, an injury and I developed a autoimmune disease that forced me to stop before, way before I was ready. And I really struggled with figuring out, you know, who is Alicia if, I'm not a dancer, I have no idea what I'm here on this earth to do. And I lived on 123rd Street at the time when I was dancing and I would walk past the campus and sometimes I'd walk on campus. And every time I stepped on campus, it felt like um, I was on an oasis somewhere. And I, I realized I wanna go here because I just feel good. I feel good stepping between these gates. I feel really, I don't know, it seems like it would be a great place to be. So I learned about School of General Studies. And when I met the admissions officers at that time, uh, you know, I said at first, you know, I'm a dancer. And the first thing they said is, we love dancers here. They, they are always the ones who, you know, are so successful in our program, your discipline, your, your ability to multitask. Um, it, I, I thought, oh my gosh, they get me. <laughs> Thankfully, I got into the program. And really, I think my time at Columbia was all about discovering who is Alicia. And I realized that I had talents in other areas that were not dance related. <clears throat> and I was mentored by some really incredible scholars who helped me to realize that no matter what, I'm always going to be tied to dance. I actually wrote, I was a history major. And I wrote my thesis on the first 10 years of Dance Theater of Harlem. And so it really brought me closer to the thing that I love and gave me so much more understanding of the world that I had the privilege of being in. Uh, and when I graduated, I knew I wanted to still be a part of, of the dance world, whether I was dancing or not. It gave me a direction. Um, if anything else, that's, that's what my Columbia experience did for me. I have one more personal story to add, and it was by virtue of being at Columbia Law School, Columbia gave me a voice. Um, and it has to do with when I was a third year writing a note uh, for the Journal of Law and the Arts. Uh, Doreen, if we could have my video, please. When I was at Columbia Law School, I wrote a note in the Journal of Arts and the Law on a subject that was troubling to me at the time. The world famous Rockettes, the dancing emblem of New York City, then were all white. Was that legal? I felt there was a deep conflict between the First Amendment and laws against discrimination. 
The New York Times then asked me to write an op-ed piece that appeared on Friday, May 31st, 1985. Very shortly thereafter, the Rockheads had their first Asian American dancer. Then, the first black dancer was added to the line. I never knew who she was, but knowing we were presenting this program on diversity, I hunted her down. Here she is, the first black Rockette, Jennifer Jones. It is really a thrill to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for reaching out. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled. Listen, I have yeah. to ask you, because <clears throat> as you know, I wrote this article, and um, I was looking for some results, but you know, I had a life. I had other things to do. I wasn't you know, ch checking the um, status of the Rockettes every day. Uh, but then some time later, I saw an ad, I believe, in the subway showing the Rockettes, you know, Christmas is coming, here are the Rockettes. And I saw that there were, there was one or two persons of colors in this line. Were you in that subway ad? Yes, I was. <laughs> Wonder if we can find <laughs> it. I would just love to see that. Um, yes. And uh, for, on behalf of Columbia, thank you very much. And thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. So I did that's a treat. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. And I remember when you wrote that article because you're just a year behind me. <laughs> exactly. So I did an interview with her, a longer interview, which I may post on YouTube if anyone's interested to see how she became a Rockette, the whole process she went through. And she was there for 15 years and later went on to uh, Broadway. Okay, so um, let me ask you, because we've cross-branded this uh, talk with... Um, um, she um, opened the door. Um, are there specific instances as women that um, you can point to in the uh, area of diversity, your brown breaking, breaking or glass ceilings or anything like that um, that you'd like to air in public? Well, you know, I would, I would also add that you know, it's not just in the arts to where there's been groundbreaking. I mean, when I became dean of students at Columbia Law School and also at Harvard, um, it, at Columbia, I was also the first dean of students, but I also, you know, first person of color in a, a dean's role. And at Harvard, I was the first dean of students and, and also one of the first um, um, deans of color at, at, at the law school in its history. Um, in, breaking ground in so many ways is still a part, as, as Alicia said, when we aren't um, talking about first, it, and it, it's just a matter of fact, I think will be when we've achieved all of those goals. I think the most important part is not to just see yourself as being the only and figuring out ways to bring more people behind you. I mean, there's a very powerful uh, painting that's always sort of, that both my mother would always talk about by, um, uh, an artist named Gilbert um, Gilbert Young, and it's um, he ain't heavy, but it shows a, a essentially a person who's like a, a black person who's coming over the wall, and they're reaching over and they're pulling somebody else up. That's what I, for me, I think is important to keep doing. So figuring out those ways where they're going to be more people, because it's not it shouldn't just be me, because there are other people just as talented, some even smarter, um, to who could take on not just the next generation, but also highlighting those people who had opportunities, if not at the institutions where I am, but in other places, so that people know that, you know, I'm not unusual, because there, there's Black excellence, uh, Latinx excellence, um, women's excellence all around. Um, and I've had the good fortune to sometimes to, to step into opportunities, but I, I do want, I think it's important for people to know that it, it's not just, it's just, just me or not just Alicia. And, and as Arthur Mitchell used to say, we were part of something that's bigger than ourselves. And that was the mantra and it stayed the mantra. And if you talk to generations of Dance Theater of Harlem people, you will, you will hear that. So I think that that, I think it's a critical piece to always remember that um, there are others to before me and there are others that will be coming behind me and I'm going to make sure that that happens. Alicia, let me go to you. We have just a few minutes left. Um, as a dancer, now Balanchine very famously quoted, uh, is quoted as saying that ballet is woman. 
So you would think that as a woman dancer, you wouldn't have that, at least not the, you know, the um, female side of it as being a big obstacle for you. But have there been other challenges as a woman that you found professionally in performing or in administration? And how do you see the field? Absolutely. I mean, we come up against challenges all the time, but I, I think, you know, in, in having the privilege of sitting here with Marsha, the reminder that our upbringing, if we can call our, our time at Dance Theater of Harlem as that, because Arthur Mitchell was someone who had a mission, um, not only to bring uh, ballet Blacks in ballet to the world, but also to really grow people who are going to carry on his vision, not only in dance, but in many, many fields. And that had a lot to do with instilling a certain pride and steadfastness in all the dancers. And if you look at the field right now, uh, you know, I know that it was groundbreaking for me to take on the role of Dean and Director at the Juilliard School. Today, there is Endelin Taylor, who was a principal dancer at Dance State of Harlem. This year, she is the newest Dean of the Dance Division at uh, North Carolina School for the Arts. There's Linda Denise Fisher Harrell, who was a dancer with Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, who I know came up in the same sort of upbringing, I'll say, as we did, and is now the artistic director of Hover Street Dance Company in Chicago. There is Dion Figgins, who is my generation, a dancer in Dance Theater of Harlem, who also came up under Arthur Mitchell, who is now the artistic director of Ballet Tech uh, in New York City. That's what I'm trying to say is, uh, we are part of a something larger. This is how we were trained. It wasn't about steps. It wasn't about how to stand on your toes. It was about how to be in this world and how to change this world. And we lived that every day from the moment you stepped into the room. In fact, when we would travel, and now I see you smiling, Marcia. <laughs> When we would travel and the company would tour, Arthur Mitchell demanded that we look like superstars. Three. And I would think like, it's the morning and we're traveling to Detroit. Like, why do I have to dress up? Um, but the idea that you present yourself in a way that is going to change people's perception of what is possible or what is the perception. And um, it, that's, that's something that really is meaningful and is the thing that will, will change perception and will continue to break those, uh, those glass ceilings. And, and Alicia and Marsha, thank you so much. And thank you to Columbia for this magnificent opportunity to discuss this uh, very important issue with our alumni family. Our next session is um, Courageous Conversation. So thank you all, and we'll see you at the next big event. Thanks so much, Gregory. Bye. Thank you, Gregory. Great to see you, Alicia. You too.